All right, well, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, I'm Hart Montgomery. I work for the Linux Foundation, uh, where I serve as the Hyperledger CTO. And we have a really exciting panel today um, about uh, blockchain in Europe. So I'd like to start by letting our excellent panelists uh, introduce themselves. Um, so if we could just get a few words about all of you briefly and all the uh, impressive stuff you all are doing. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Conrad van Deventer, uh, CTO at Circular. We based in London and primarily focused on creating traceability solutions um, in the and tra tracing raw materials from mine to the, uh, for example, EV batteries, and we're making use of Hyperledger Fabric as the blockchain. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Vanessa Sench. Um, I work at Fujitsu as head of marketing of our enterprise blockchain solution center. Um, and I'm uh, happy to be here to discuss uh, this uh, topic, um, as I believe that Europe is in fact um, a, a great space for blockchain uh, innovation. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Jesus Ruiz, and uh, I'm currently with uh, several hats. I am a board member and CTO of Alastria Blockchain Association, a Spanish blockchain association built in the infrastructure for use cases in the real economy. I have also participated uh, in the technical working groups in, in, in the uh, building of the uh, European blockchain services infrastructure uh, blockchain, uh, probably in the future more, more national blockchains, but essentially focusing on infrastructure, more than use cases, infrastructure which enables use cases which cannot be deployed in the current blockchains. Great, thank you all. So since we are at a Open Source Summit Europe, um, I'd like to start by asking a question specifically about Europe. So when it comes to blockchain and blockchain markets, the US tends to get most of the attention. Uh, and you know perhaps there's some attention on Asia as well. But there's sort of been considerably less attention on Europe. Um, what would you say distinguishes Europe as a blockchain market compared to the US or Asia? Um, yeah, in the, Europe seems to lag behind a bit in uh, the innovation space with blockchain. There seem to be more startups, more uh, smaller companies, and more investments being put into it in the US, especially. Um, but in Europe, again, it, it seems to be more national level or more governmental type of funding for it, looking at solving real problems in the region and how those could be addressed by uh, using blockchain? So from uh, my perspective, um, Europe um, is known um, by um, a lot of um, new regulations. Um, and I believe that uh, not only that, but other things as a marketing professional, I must highlight um, GDPR has paved the way uh, as um, blockchain uh, solutions um, aim to contribute um, to solve uh, real world problems. And um, as I was mentioning, new uh, regulations um, also um, will, um, will pave the way for the uh, innovation in blockchain. So um, I would say that we have a huge opportunity here, um, not only for, um, as I was saying, uh, innovation in blockchain, uh, but also to, to be aligned uh, with uh, those new requirements. Um, and we also have uh, government support. So we have a lot of initiatives um, here in Europe that support uh, blockchain, uh, not only, um, as I was saying, innovation, but also um, blockchain um, uh, projects uh, related to uh, sustainability, for instance. Um, so, um, yeah, so basically I believe that Europe is in fact uh, a good uh, space, a fascinating area for blockchain. So I believe that the time is now, actually. So a lot of opportunities. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Uh, I mean, in my opinion, there are many, many uh, aspects 
even cultural, but I would say that three are the most important in my opinion. One is the uh, focus of the European uh, governments and the European Commission and the European Union on uh, protecting the general persons, the general people, not just the savvy people or the people who have a lot of uh, money to invest in and so on, but protecting because we have uh, 500 million people and many of them have uh, problems, so we have to make this uh, a, a better society. That's the focus. You can see this type of regulations in GDPR, uh, data consum uh, sorry, uh, uh, consumer uh, protection uh, directive. You can see right now in MICA. So that focus is uh, protecting. So. Uh, many people think that uh, the regulation, or some people think that the regulation is in reality a barrier by some institutions to the innovation. Uh, my point of view is totally the contrary. The focus is the person. The most important thing in the world is the person, not the business or any other thing. So the quality of citizens is something which has to be uh, enabled. Another factor, of course, is uh, venture capital. Okay? So in Europe, we have less than, uh, for example, in the US and other regions. Okay? And this is very important. But the third is related to, 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 the, to the second is uh, the focus is on the people, so the focus is on building things for the real economy versus the financial economy. You know that the world has real economy, financial economy. Financial economy is banking, uh, assets, digital assets, and so on. So there is a lot of money to be made in financial economy, but in the reality, financial economy should be at the service of the real economy. The real economy is health, food, dressing, roads, the real things, the real things that make or break the life of the citizens and make the quality better. And not many, thing, not many citizens in Europe have a lot of money to invest in risky investment instruments. So the focus of Europe is on things that are not attractive to risk capital or to venture capitalists that they want to invest and then get a, a benefit. So the focus in Europe is on real economy, and then you, you need financial uh, mechanisms, and then you have MICA, and so on. But most of the things go under the radar, and I can tell you Europe is the most advanced region in the world on blockchain for the real things. Great. Thank you all. I will, I'm sure we will have some follow-ups to those points. Um, I wanted the next question to start with uh, Conrad here. Um, but everyone else can feel free to weigh in. So you and Circular have built what I would say is one of the most, I'll call it real, enterprise blockchain applications, um, obviously focused on supply chain, um, and it's deployed out there today. Um, can you comment on some of the challenges and things you've had to overcome to really make enterprise blockchain real? Thanks. Um, yeah, so when we started about five years ago, um, there wasn't so yeah, it was, the tech was very new, and uh, there wasn't a lot of other business cases or other examples to look at and see what to learn or what's there already out, and just reuse or not, but learn from them, see what mistakes and challenges they've had. So there's a lot of um, <coughs> things we had to pick up and adapt, and as the business is growing, the amount of transactions are going through, we keep having to adapt um, this new technology and seeing what's the limits of it. So, uh, but one of the non, not technical, but one of the challenges was also education, because people think, well, they, yeah, Bitcoin is blockchain. So there's, there's always that hurdle and um, all those uh, buzzwords and stuff, well, then they want to know, well, what's the point? Wh why, what's, what's the energy usage of this blockchain you're trying to use? Because you're, you're trying to be sustainable, but now actually you're making it worse. So there's a lot of education in there. But recently, it also become more about interoperability because companies don't just want to buy into one technology, do all that investment, and then find out a few years later, well, actually, there's a new or better one until, this, until all the blockchain technology have more matured. So inter interoperability is one of the new ones that we try to address and get around to. Great. Does anyone else want to comment on this, making blockchain real? I know both of uh, you know both of you two have also uh, been involved in real blockchain deployments. So, would you like to comment? Well, um, yeah, we have uh, some exciting projects. Um, one of them um, is botanical water. Uh, and actually we received uh, an award 
from Alistria, um, um, and their sustainability award this summer. Um, and we actually have other uh, projects where we are solving real world problems. So, um, and we co-create with our customers um, to, to address their needs. So we are focused on um, customer needs and not on technology. Technology will solve the, the problem, but uh, we need to address um, these customer needs and challenges that they have. Um, and it is what uh, we are doing with our customers. So we have um, a lot of um, success stories, not only under sustainability, but uh, uh, regarding also tokenization, for instance. Um, and um, yeah, so basically we are addressing those challenges with a technology that uh, gives um, transparency to the supply chain um, and people can trust on data because uh, it is immutable, right? So um, we have a, a huge opportunity um, once again, um, to innovate in this area uh, if we work with our customers uh, and if we are focused on their challenges. Thank you. <clears throat> well, uh, as I said, I have been focusing for many years, eight, seven, eight years right now, uh, essentially on uh, the infrastructure because uh, I was before in Banco Santander and then in IBM. I've been uh, implementing uh, distributed ledgers uh, for 40 years. So distributed ledger, ledgers, DLTs as they are called, is something very boring which is not really the, the, the focus of uh, my job. My, 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 my intention right now, or what I'm doing right now, is trying to do decentralized log technology. The word decentralized is very important. I know that crypto anarchists and so on want to call uh, other projects which are not Bitcoin or Ethereum distributed ledgers because they want uh, to say, well, this is just private things. No, uh, I've been focusing on what is the infrastructure for the future internet, the next generation internet. By the way, right now, okay, there's a huge uh, unit in, in, in the European Commission called next generation internet. And then I have been involved first on uh, creating an actual blockchain uh, for those real use cases, non-financial use cases, because for financial use cases, uh, okay, you can do things uh, right now, but not for real use cases for the real society, for 500 million uh, citizens in Europe, you need another infrastructure which is like the internet. You need a public critical infrastructure, public in the sense, in the correct sense, not in the crypto anarchist public sense, which is anonymous. Public, like public education, like public health, like public services of any kind, and public roads which are permissioned. So you need permissioning. That's not mean private. Permissioning is a, re a requirement for anything which is decentralized. So decentralization requires permission. This is something that uh, we already know from Bitcoin experiments and so on. So what we are building right now is the actual infrastructure for pan-European use cases. This is European blockchain services infrastructure, which is uh, in pre-production. And right now, the legal instrument for operate this in a decentralized way without any single operator is being created by the European Commission. The Spanish government has already approved a project to create a national blockchain, which is called ISBE, e -I -S -B -E, which is a palindrome of uh, FC, okay, but because they are related. Uh, the focus of uh, the pan-European blockchain network is pan-European cross-border use cases, okay, actual blo uh, blockchain use cases, and as a trust framework, one of the several trust frameworks for the upcoming EIDAS regulation, the EIDAS 2. You have heard about the European Digital Identity Wallet and so on. You need a trust framework, okay? Uh, that's going to be, uh, one of the trust frameworks is going to be, not the unique, but one of the trust frameworks is going to be the uh, European Blockchain Services Infrastructure. And then at the national and regional level, you need uh, some infrastructure which uh, implements what uh, I call the proof of democracy consensus algorithm. We need proof of democracy. Proof of richness, like uh, proof of work, proof of stake, and proof of everything, okay, you, you name it, they are not suitable for those type of use cases. So we need proof of democracy in infra infrastructure, which is public, decentralized, 
permission and proof of democracy. This is the things that uh, we are building. And they are coming very fast. Great. Thanks a lot for that. So Conrad mentioned uh, education and the challenges around that on blockchain. Um, and, you know, Vanessa, since you're a marketing executive, I wanted to start this question with you. Um, but one of the biggest challenges in blockchain is, in fact, you know, talking to potential customers or users who aren't so tech savvy about blockchain. Maybe they don't understand the technology. Maybe they don't care about the technology. Maybe they just want to see the end results, right? And perhaps their exposure to blockchain is through things like Bitcoin or perhaps more recently uh, FTX uh, or some less than savory activities. So from your perspective as a marketing executive, uh, how do you talk about blockchain to these people who are perhaps not as educated? So um, as I was saying, um, we need to focus on uh, customer needs and not on the technology. But of course, that when we are talking with potential uh, customers, um, we need to talk about technology, and it is blockchain. Um, and uh, I must say that I'm not uh, a technical person as well, and I believe that helps uh, when I'm uh, communicating to the market to different target personas. And of course, we have some of those people that are not familiar with the technology. And um, unfortunately, we still need to clarify, demystify um, the, the concept of blockchain because we uh, sometimes we are talking with customers and they are saying, oh yeah, it's Bitcoin. And so we need to um, uh, clarify that blockchain is much more than digital uh, currencies. Uh, and, um, and actually, um, it's easier to uh, explain with real um, use cases, right? And um, so we have, as I was saying before, some su success stories with our customers, and uh, we can talk about that. Uh, what was the problem of that customer? How we addressed the, the problem uh, and the results? And uh, besides this, I believe that's important to uh, communicate the benefits of blockchain because when we are talking ablo uh, about blockchain, they are saying, oh, okay, um, energy consumption <laughs> because of Bitcoin. So, uh, and we need to say, well, in fact, our solution is addressed uh, to solve uh, sustainability challenges. And we are talking about um, a solution that, in fact, is going to support you in your uh, sustainability uh, strategy. So uh, I believe that if we uh, can um, give some concrete examples, it's easier to understand that uh, blockchain is, in fact, a technology with huge potential. Um, and uh, we have a lot of opportunities uh, to solve real world problems. So, yeah. Would anyone else like to elaborate on this? Just some comments. I mean, uh, right now, uh, from uh, my explanation, you can see that I'm, I'm focusing on infrastructure for the use cases, but I, I, I have to be involved in some use cases. Uh, most of the use cases that I'm involved with uh, are uh, very foul credentials, traceability, time stamping, okay, and truthness of information. So uh, some people now have realized that it is not a good idea to store personal information in blockchain. Come on. <laughs> We know this uh, for 50 years, okay? Uh, blockchain or whatever, uh, uh, public databases. But public information is good. So the use cases that I'm focusing right now is not, again, financial use cases, because for that you have Ethereum, you have many, many, many uh, possibilities, okay? Uh, but for real use cases, we don't have the infrastructure. So I'm focusing on infrastructure. So at the end, my product is not a commercial product, it's a common good, it's an infrastructure, is uh, the next backbone, internet backbone, when I talk about the internet, I'm talking about the cables, the fiber cables, okay? And I don't know if you know how this works, okay? But for example, in Europe, uh, most of the providers, uh, Telefonica, Deutsche Telekom, and so on, Vodafone, and so on, they are connected between all of them 
to enable the traffic in some points called IXPs, Internet Exchange Points, which are managed in Europe by non-profits, neutral entities. So the network is public because it's available to the general public. Anybody can contract access to that network and then uh, you can do whatever you want. It's private it's an, and then privacy. You have privacy and permissioning. So the next blockchain is the next generation internet which is going to be transparent. You don't have to explain uh, for your use case, hey, uh, dear customer, uh, I'm going to do this uh, e-business. By the way, we need internet. Say, come on, internet is there. So blockchain is going to be there. It's going to be transparent, speci specifically for the citizens, because the citizens are not going to be involved in the real world, okay? Not for financial, for real uh, economy use cases. And then most of the companies are going to be also like, this is another internet with other properties. And those, the, 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 the things that are difficult to do. Why? Why? Ability in a, an infrastructure which is not owned or controlled or operated by anybody. It's a collaborative operation, transparent, so you know who is who. It's good for the business. But this is very easy to explain. You might be okay because at the end. But the problem is, yeah, good use case. Where do we put this? Okay, we don't have this. Okay. Yeah, I think that sometimes all the customers think that blockchain is this solution that we're just going to solve this. But once it becomes more, what's some of the more, some of the infrastructure can go, and it just becomes more about that. People don't focus on what's the what technology is in there. You have to real look at what's the real problem you're trying to solve. The property, the property of the blockchain mm -hmm. is this thing. just helps to underpin the evidence mm -hmm. and then then the then start getting real better. Great and continuing on that data infrastructure. Uh, so the question for you to start with this is, is um, you know more and more sort of public blockchains uh, are being driven by evidence. Public commission blockchains. And so you've been involved in two of the biggest efforts so far um, blockchain uh, and FC. Uh, for those of you that are interested in one, uh, uh, Latin America, America, a bunch of countries there, and the other, obviously, by Europe. Um, so, what are some of the differences uh, working on government blockchain projects as compared to the traditional enterprise blockchain projects? That's a very really good question. Uh, many years ago, uh, companies, big companies, okay, came okay, to me and said, hey, I want to build my blockchain. Like, I, I want to build my artificial intelligence, my database, my blockchain. How do I do my blockchain? And the answer was, sorry, if this is your blockchain, then it's totally useless. That's it, that's it. And then the businesses approach any technology, like artificial intelligence, not Let's do a common good. Let's make this useful for all others or for the society. It has to be of benefit for me, my shareholders, directors, and then I'm going to kill the uh, competition. From the rural perspective, it's totally different. It's in, the, in the European Union. I mean, the focus is again on a fair economy, competitive, transparent, and so on. So at the end, there are some rules. And then the business has to comply. There are some values. So, the business, from the point of view of the government, the uh, approach to the blockchain is like uh, with any other technology. This technology has to be good for all citizens, not just for one specific set of citizens with money to invest in so There has to be a common group. So again, from the public administrations, they try to focus on use cases, but they understand very, very, but they understand very simple. No. Without an infrastructure, which actually complies with the values of the European Union, it's impossible to deploy any use case which can be uh, according to the European values. So we need the problem to solve the problem of the problem of infrastructure. This is coming very fast. Okay? And Europe, again, is the most advanced country in the world. And then, then, who is going to operate the blockchain? That was also uh, a problem. Well, in, Alaska, in, in, in Spain, I was uh, first in, in Banco Santander, uh, we had the same problem. We have very fantastic use cases and no infrastructure. Let's create this. And then somehow it happened. 
a collaboration of many entities to uh, create an, an actual infrastructure. We created an association, which is called Alastria, and we have a network, which uh, right now we have uh, 200 uh, different companies there uh, from different public administration. You have uh, all types, okay? Alastria is 500 members, and then this infrastructure is not big, okay? It's only three or four million transactions per month, okay? But again, the type of transactions are traceability, okay? And production use cases, for example, we have uh, some uh, very notorious use cases, not just in Spain, from the Council d'Europe, from uh, France, from other countries, I mean, it's international, but it's still Spanish. But now, but then, uh, the governance model was that Alastria Association has not to operate anything. Who is operating the network? The different entities. Who is the owner of the network? The participants. That's a difficult model. But we have been successful, and then the European Commission called me, okay, because they wanted to create a pan-European blockchain, but the problem is that they didn't want to operate this uh, as a blockchain, as a, as a, as a service, BAS. Okay, with IBM or whatever, or any company. Or they didn't want to put the operator in a single country, like Germany, because then French, France uh, would say, no, 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 here, because we have the, the Tour Eiffel and so on. And then the, the Swedish, uh, no, 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 you don't agree? Okay, here. And then the Italians, and then the Spanish, ah, come on. No. Right now, for example, in this infrastructure, they copied, well, I, I participated in the decentralized governance model, and then they even improved the model. And there is a decentralized governance model. So each validator is operated by each country. So it's impossible that one country can dominate the network or can censor or can do anything. So the control of the network that one given country, no matter the size, has on the network is even less than in the European Parliament. Okay? So that's good. It's decentralized in the sense that I am European, I trust on the European authorities, and then I trust on this blockchain network. In the, Span in the Spanish government approved a, a project to create a blockchain where each node is going to be operated by at least one regional, different regional government, okay? They don't really cooperate a lot, we have 19, and then also the private sector, because we have more experience. So those are the type of infrastructure that I said, decentralized in the sense that nobody has control, but everybody knows who is going to do or who is doing what, and they are accountable. So if somebody does something wrong, we have the European uh, le legislation and the regulation. So that's not a major problem. So the incentives are proof of democracy, like everything which is go uh, working here. Because, by the way, just a comment, I have never, ever in my life seen a more centralized infrastructure than Bitcoin and Ethereum. It's incredible. But everybody is saying decentralized. Well, without saying what decentralization means. For me, decentralization means the type of infrastructure. So, blockchain. Then blockchain also approaches. Appro uh, approach uh, Alastria. Alastria is a founding member of the blockchain uh, blockchain network, which you can imagine what is that. It was, I mean, they don't have the European Commission, they have the, the, the Bank of, Invest of Investment, which is uh, non-profit and so on, and then uh, under this, they created a blockchain network which has the intention to be decentralized. So nobody should be controlling this infrastructure. And then the model, we have the model, backbone, internet backbone. So we already know that this more or less works. There are some countries that are going to kill this, okay? They are going to kill anything, okay? Which is not controlled by them. But this is the right model, has proven to work, and blockchain has to learn and adapt the model of the governance of the internet. Great, uh, thanks a lot. Um, we have about 10 minutes left, but you know we have more questions for the panelists, but I wanted to ask if anyone from the audience wanted to ask uh, any particular panelist or the entire group of panelists collectively a question. Yeah, um, I was gonna say, you mentioned you're, you're building a pan-European blockchain. What can you actually do with it? Is it like Bitcoin? It's effectively a, 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 a mechanism. Is it a mechanism for exchanging tokens or is it a smart contract engine? Because you're creating this infrastructure, but <coughs> what can you do with it? So I'm gonna repeat the question for online audience. Um, so the question was about the uh, European blockchain infrastructure and what can it do? Is that a fair assessment? Great. Okay, that's a good question because uh, when, when somebody uh, thinks uh, blockchain is Bitcoin or whatever, no, non-financial use cases. What can you do? The main use case 
is going to be one of the biggest trust frameworks for the upcoming European digital identity wallet because, uh, for example, and then there are some use cases, for example, diplomas, interoperability of diplomas, traceability of diplomas, but the diploma information is going, not going to be registered in the blockchain. Forget about registering any personal information, just evidence. And then it makes the blockchain incredibly useful. You can say, come on, no, but this is not the, 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 the initial intention of blockchain. Well, who cares about the initial intention? What we care is about the usefulness of some technology for the citizens, and then traceability. So diplomas, but you need identities. So imagine the following. Where is a single database with all the public universities in Europe? All the public universities in Europe. Who is managing this database? Second. When somebody is presented to you a diploma from a given university in Germany, how do you know that this university, which is a medical doctor diploma, is authorized to issue this diploma? So it's not just public key infrastructure. So it's going to be a public key infrastructure on steroids, not just who is this guy or who is this public entity. By the way, the entities, the digital identities of the legal persons, businesses, and organizations, never persons, ne never natural persons, all public information, uh, is going to be registered in the blockchain together with some additional data, metadata, which is going to say, I am uh, this university, and by the way, I have the authorization from the Ministry of Education of Germany, okay, to uh, issue this type of diplomas on this year, because next year, I don't know. So you will be able to verify a verifiable credential in a very efficient way, by the way, not even asking the issuer. You are going to look at your blockchain node, okay? Social security is another project. Payments, I mean, name it. Anything to do with verifiable credentials. The main use case is not going to be tokens. Well, tokens is, are going to be useful, but the main real, uh, the real economy the main requirement is verifiable credentials, so those are statements which can be verifiable very efficiently, and then you need a trust framework. And for many use cases, you need a pan-European trust framework, and in Spain, we need a pan-Spain trust framework, because, for example, health information. How do you know that this information that uh, this citizen is presenting to me is coming from the real thing? And you can see something that nobody, know, nobody saw, and then I, I have an article about this, is the COVID. The European implementation of the COVID uh, certificate, the COVID, uh, was the first one to implement a trust framework which was pan-European. So many entities in Europe could issue to the citizens the credentials, the verifiable credentials, not in W3C, but this is verifiable credential, okay? Digitally signed by the sure, and then very efficient to verify without contacting to the sure, because something like a blockchain, pan-European blockchain, was created with the public keys. No, no, no. As I said, it's the concept. It was a trust framework. Of course not. Why? Because there was no infrastructure for doing this. Because otherwise, or maybe because it was not there. And my point is that uh, maybe for, for health, uh, it's going to be done. But the concept is exactly the same. So the, the, the European countries created something like a trust framework developing ad hoc a blockchain, because every member state was required to run a server with all the public keys of the rest. So they had to design and implement, I was involved in the project, a uh, synchronization, a replication mechanism between all the servers, because the public keys of the issuer in one country was the responsibility of the, of the country. And the problem was, how do I make my public is available in an efficient way and, and robust and trusted way to all the other countries. By, by the way, uh, it has been expanded to non-European countries. 65 countries have these servers. So at the end, there was no other because it was created in months, okay? So it was impossible to do this. So how did it work? Well, it was, we say, a hacking, okay? Because in Luxembourg, the European Commission was running a server. Every member state had to send the public keys and the updates and the deletes to Luxembourg. And then every member state had to take back all the keys of all the other uh, things. Mm, 
is a replication mechanism where every member state, there was no single operator. And then, in order to verify the certificate, the mobile application had to check where? In a central database of uh, Germany? No. In home, for example. Well, actually, for example, I, I, I implemented the, the verifier and the wallet, and they swore for one regional government, and then we were in Spain, but we used the, the trusted list from Sweden, because Sweden was the first country to, to publicize this. But the, the, the critical thing is that the concept, the idea was that, and this problem can be solved much more efficiently with a proper blockchain. That's the point. But of course, there was no blockchain. There was not. But it was a blockchain, a poor man blockchain. Awesome. We only have a couple minutes left, um, so I'd like to close with the following question from the panel for the panelists. I know Vanessa, you said earlier, you know, the time is now, um, and Jesus, you said, you know, this is coming. Uh, so, what blockchain use cases do you think will have the most traction in Europe over the next few years, and why? So I, I think the, yeah, the, as Yusis was saying, the, the key to the success of some of these projects is this infrastructure being available. So, and the verifiable credentials being there for organizations. So you know, so for example, interestability in CO2 tracking, if you want to see in a supply chain network, who are the worst contributors to CO2, or if somebody claimed to be green, the, the real evidence that's there and anybody else being able to look up that that's true and not just accept a certificate by a consultant company. Like those type of things. Not I don't think it's gonna be just one use case of only traceability, but it's gonna be how these layers of data can add to each other. Once you have traceability, you can start to add energy uses on top of that. You can start to add compliance information on top of that, that create a much richer picture of what's going on in a specific region and uh, for specific organizations. I believe that you already know my answer, so it is uh, sustainability. Okay, so I believe um, that um, we are going to have, well, we already have some regulations, right, and we are expecting more. Uh, and uh, it's going to be uh, mandatory for some companies, uh, financial or non-financial institutions, uh, to deliver uh, strict reporting about uh, their sustainability practices. Uh, and I believe that uh, blockchain technology uh, can be uh, a huge uh, partner here uh, to, um, to guarantee that that information, that the ESG data, it is actually um, correct, as you were saying. Uh, so w with blockchain, uh, we know that um, that uh, company um, is sustainable because um, we have proof of that. And I would like to share too that um, at Fujitsu we are developing um, actually an ESG reporting platform. Um, and of course that we are going, uh, we are using uh, blockchain uh, technology uh, because of that, because uh, it, we cannot say that uh, I'm green. I need to prove that I am, in fact, green. And also other stakeholders are uh, demanding that, for instance, you have employees or even consumers that uh, are um, giving some pressure to their um, I know, uh, brands, for instance, uh, to have um, sustainable practices. And um, I believe that is going to be a huge opportunity uh, here. Um, and uh, let uh, blockchain um, shine, I would say, and to remove uh, friction and to give um, that traceability, that trust on data, that it is going to be essential uh, for a lot of companies here in Europe. Yeah, so 
again, you know my, my answer. Uh, but once you have an infrastructure, which uh, doesn't have to be as complete as uh, 100, but uh, a viable infrastructure, and then you have an interoperable digital identity, like the European digital identity, then you can deploy use cases on that infrastructure, uh, and then you are not going to create silos. Because, for example, for traceability, you most probably have to know who is, doing, who is writing what, who is saying what. Because essentially, you say something, and then you cannot retract, because it's there, and you cannot delete it. Okay? But you know to, 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 to identify the, the, the writer. So, uh, then, because you are lacking a, a common infrastructure as a common good available to, to, to anybody, then uh, you create private, you clubs, you create clubs, and you create logistic chains which are silos. The only way to solve this is to have an infrastructure like the internet, which is public, accessible to anyone who contracts access, and that's it, with fair prices, and then digital identity. And then the use cases are going to be based on traceability, and I uh, expect on verifiable credentials. And then on the verifiable credential side, I expect that once this is uh, available, the infrastructure and the identity, the public administrations are going to issue anything that public administrations, local governments, uh, uh, and so on, okay, in my city, uh, you can ask for uh, your certificate of uh, residency, to a bank to, for a certificate of whatever, but the public administrations, any Thing, any document that issued right now to the citizens and the businesses in the form of uh, paper or PDF, they are going to be verifiable credentials with traceability in the case of businesses, for example. So anything which is a document is going to be con uh, uh, trans uh, transformed into a verifiable credential. By the way, not an NFT in most of the cases because you cannot create a secondary market, for example, for a diploma. Well, maybe if you are in a secondary market for diplomas, then, then, yes, then uh, it's because you have uh, things that uh, have to be killed. So most of the important things, and my certificate of residency, can you imagine a secondary market for this? Well, there is also, okay? <laughs> so we have to avoid this. So most of the uh, critical things in this life are not NFTs or tokens because there are no secondary for, for that. You are not going to sell things more than once, okay? So verifiable credentials for many things. <laughs> more than once, yeah? <laughs> well, no, the initial, <laughs> which may be free, okay? So once it's issued, that's it. It's to you, this is you, okay? And this is the, 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 the very easy to do right now, specifically in Europe, because uh, digital certificates coupled with verifiable credentials. Verifiable credentials will have to be digitally signed with digital certificates using advanced or qualified signatures in Europe. Then the verifiable credential is going to be a document which are, is, is fully legal in front of the court. It's like a PDF, but much more efficient because instead of having one person reading the text to verify that this is uh, the document, it's machine readable. So you are going to avoid a lot of back offices. And that's it, very easy in Europe, not uh, any, anywhere else. <laughs> All right, well, that's it. Let's thank our panelists.